Good morning, River Valley. I'm so thankful you guys are here. Whether you're watching this alone in front of your computer or in your living room with your family, I'm thankful that you're joining us every Sunday morning uh, for worship together online. So we're in the middle of a sermon series and we're talking about the 23rd Psalm and, and looking at the 23rd Psalm from the idea of as we walk through life, what does it look like to follow Jesus, the Good Shepherd? So in our context, what does it look like to be a Christian? What are the stations along the way? How does he lead us along the paths? 
And we're going to talk about the, that today. In fact, we're going to see the first sense of true movement that we see in this, this passage of Scripture. And so as I thought about and was looking at for you who are parents who are watching today, uh, as we talk about moving from one place to another as believers, he, he uh, changes our scenery. I think it's a good time for you to think about this question in your parent queue, which is what's uh, for your children, help prepare them for what's next. In other words, you've walked the road that they're on. You know what it's like to be in middle school. You know what it's like to be in high school. You, and you know where things are coming next. And so you can use your personal experience, both positive and negative, uh, to help them successfully navigate the next season. And some of that's just by knowing what's coming. I remember in middle school talking to our, our children about uh, this will be the time in your life where you will start to see some of your friends deviate from Christianity and embrace the world. When you're in high school, this is going to be some of the time where, where you will see wholesale abandonment, where you will lose some friends for the, the, the cause of Christ. And helping prepare them for that really did, at least in that sense, uh, help them understand, okay, well, this is it, it, this was going to happen. That I, I'm going to follow Jesus. And, and I knew that not everyone would. And so that that, that, that preparation of us telling them, I think, really did make a difference in their life. You can do that with your children as well. What's next? Help them know that. So again, we're going to read the 23rd Psalm today. Uh, we're going to read it uh, out loud. Uh, we're going to concentrate today on verse number three. But you and I, I want us to read all of the Psalm every week out loud, even if you're at home, even if you're by yourself or with people, because I want you to get uh, so familiar with saying this Psalm over and over again by the, by the uh, end of the sermon series. It's, it's old hat. It's memorized. It's something that you can come back to again and again, because it is a true, true comfort in the life of the believer. So here we go. We're going to say it out loud together. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. So last week we talked about that we were in the green pasture and the, the quiet waters. And so today we're going to look at, at the, the, uh, an, an unusual statement right after that. Because we're still technically in the green pastures. We're in the quiet waters. I mean, we have enough. And then all of a sudden, uh, you, you have this sheep say something very weird. Psalm 23 is written by a sheep talking about his shepherd, in a sense, teaching other sheep what it's like to be a shepherd following uh, Jesus, the good sh or what it's like to be a sheep following the good shepherd and, and convincing them to become a believer, telling them what it's like. And then all of a sudden he says this weird statement because he says, I'm in green pastures, I'm in quiet waters, he renews my life. Why, why would he say that? It, it seems out of place. Why would he need life renewal? He's got uh, green pastures. He's got quiet waters. And so uh, it seems very out of place. In fact, it, it seems to be that if, if most Americans thought about the 23rd Psalm, they would write it this way. The Lord is my shepherd. My life is perfect. <laughs> there are no problems. Everything is smooth and easy and exactly as I knew it would be and exactly the timing and the way. And, and I had it planned out and it just fell into place perfectly. But all of a sudden, the sheep now is in some sort of trouble. He needs life renewal. He needs saving. He, this is the first time in the believer's life or, or the, the next time, possibly, when you experience maybe uh, anxiety, when you experience depression, when you experience something is going on where you, you have a problem. And so here, here is the, the, the lesson from this, and then I'm going to unpack it. The problem isn't situational, it's spiritual. The problem isn't situational. The sheep doesn't need, at this exact point, a new situation. The sheep needs a new way of thinking. It's a spiritual problem. 
and then therefore a new way of doing. It's a spiritual problem. So, so when we talk about he renews my life or uh, in uh, King James it says he restores my soul, shows that, that our life is spiritual in nature. It's talking about that, that we're in, we're, it, it's not a, a bad situation. All of a sudden though, something is wrong. What is wrong is not where the shepherd has led us. What is wrong is the way the sheep have acted what they have done. And so let me show you a picture of what this looks like. This is a picture of a sheep that has been cast, C-A-S-T. And so this, this sheep up here, so I love this picture because he's in the green pasture, right? He's right there. But you see the sheep on its side. This is called being cast. It reminds me of the old uh, commercial help. I've fallen and I can't get up. This is, this is exactly what that is for the sheep. What has happened is uh, sheep love to lay down. They're most likely to be cast when they're very big, they're very fat, or they, they like to, to lay down in depressions in the dirt. And they like to lay down right in the middle on their side because it kind of cups them, it kind of makes them feel uh, secure. But again, remember from first week, sheep aren't very intelligent at all. And so if they don't lay down on their side in the middle of, of, of this depression, if they start it right here, what they're going to do is they're going to roll on their back and they're going to have their legs up in the air and a sheep that is cast in this way cannot get up he is caught she is caught they cannot move from this location well it's uncomfortable first of all but it actually the way their bodies are designed it immediately begins a process where they can't exhale gases it begins to to build up in in their system they be, they, they begin to lose some some faculty it, it doesn't do well and and a sheep that is this way in cool weather will eventually die in a few days in hot weather will eventually die in a few hours also, the sheep begins to bleed out for the shepherd, for someone to come in and to save them, which is what it needs to do. It needs to call out to the shepherd. The problem is, is that's a dinner bell for, for predators. And uh, this, they know, they hear that sound of that worry. They know that sheep is incapacitated and that's a dinner bell for predators. So, so uh, they're in trouble. They, they are, are in a good spot. Again, it's not situational, but they've, they've fallen over. They've, they've done something something themselves and they've fallen over. And so I, I, love, I love this picture and, and what it means for us because when the shepherd comes, he immediately comes to the sheep. When he, uh, he uh, a good shepherd will always be counting his sheep to make sure that there's one not off to the side who who has been cast and he's also watching overhead because buzzards will start to circle when when a sheep is like that knowing that the the, the sheep is maybe close to death and so he's watching for these things and and this the the book that I'm reading uh, had this great illustration of he comes over and uh, he had some sheep that every, all sheep get cast from from time to time that, that it's normal some sheep do it over and over again it's like they don't learn and and he has this this picture of him talking to his sheep what they have to do is they have to turn them right side up they they're, 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 the blood runs out of their legs and so even when they stand back up they, they fall down so he's he's sitting there uh, once he turns them right and before he tries to stand them up he's he's circulating blood he's he's massaging their bodies circulating blood back in them and then there's this great uh, way that he talks to them and uh, let me show you what he says in the book he says uh, the language was always a combination of tenderness and rebuke compassion and correction the language that when, when we get cast is always this, this shepherd going, it's okay, it's okay, you're all right, I'm here, you're safe. Why do you keep doing this? Let's, let's learn from this. Let's, it's, it's compassion and correction. It's, it's both of those together. And I love this imagery because I think some of us have the idea that when we fall, that immediately, if Jesus saves us at all, maybe he just leaves us alone, but if he saves us, he's going to be angry. He's going to be mad. Why did you do this? What, what is wrong with you? What, maybe that's an experience that you've had in the past, but that's not God 
God's way. He's tender. He, he does rebuke us. He does say, hey, you, you can't keep doing this. It's dangerous for you. But at the same time, it's I understand. It's okay. I'm here. I will always be here for you. I will always set you back right. The Bible says he's patient, uh, long-suffering, meaning he, even for those sheep that do it over and over again, come on, uh, we're going to get better, but I need you to, you know, trust me. It's okay. It's okay. That, that, that kind of tender language. And I, I love that, that picture of God in our lives because we sometimes remember we fall we fall this is David is is talking about this David knew God intimately yet he expressed this idea of I need life renewal this is the picture of Psalm 51 where where David uh, uh, asked God to renew his life after a sinful time in his life and, and we have to be so careful that we uh, are, are willing to call out to Jesus when we are in a bad place, in a bad position. The mature Christian, uh, in fact, uh, calls out to Jesus when they are in trouble. The mature Christian calls out to Jesus when they sin, uh, running to him for forgiveness and correction because they know how gentle he is and that he will set them back up and set them back on their feet. And so I think there's a, there, there's a point in this. Uh, I think the point is that the, the people are, you and I are most likely to be cast. You and I are most likely to fall over when we uh, run to or when we go to uh, or adopt a mentality of the cozy spot, the easy life the the everything is okay and we don't uh practice in our own life uh this this um disciplined life of following jesus in fact we just we want ease and convenience this has seeped into america america has gone from the 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 american dream being uh, an ability to to provide well for your family and have a job that that, that brings meaning and fulfillment that, those type of things to being so rich that you don't have to work at all and being famous for it and and uh uh, uh you know just a life of of extreme luxury and convenience and ease and that that tends to be what we think of as the Amer american dream today with lots of fans and lots of fame, but you don't really do anything. You, you're, just, you're just wealthy and you just do whatever you want. And, and that's, a, that's a, a recipe for disaster. The sheep, when he goes to lay over and just relax for a while, that's when they're most likely to be cast. And in the same way, you and I, when we adopt a mentality, uh, even like me, midlife, even when you've worked hard, maybe up till this point, when you adopt this sort of like, I'm going to just settle in, I'm going to coast, I'm going to, I'm going to not uh, try as hard uh, where, uh, you know, I don't read as much because Netflix is there. I understand that temptation and uh, I often go for Netflix. Uh, it, that's when we're in danger. That's when you are, and I are in danger, when we don't, we don't search after the, the, the deep things of God. Instead, what we do is, is we look for ease and convenience along the way. So we've got to be careful. Now, um, just yesterday, so I, I, for you guys watching, uh, I'm filming in the middle of the week. And just yesterday, I, uh, I read this, this book. It's got um, about 20 to 30 page biographies of all these famous people and uh, read a new one. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, it was fantastic. Like I went home and told my wife, I was like, let me tell you all about uh, this man, George Washington uh, Carver. And so I'm going to use him actually for two illustrations. Let me show you uh, his picture. And uh, George Washington Carver, just, just a few stories. Fascinating, fascinating uh, life. And uh, uh, you know uh, later on uh, him as a scientist, uh, particularly um, uh, with peanuts and and uh, sweet potatoes, some other things, but really it was more it was more agriculture as a whole, uh, and and uh, in the Tuskegee uh, Institute. Uh, but early in his life, let me tell you a story of how he got to be uh, really truly one of the most famous men in the world. Uh, and and so it was this amazing account of how he came to be educated. He was a true genius. He was, uh, God used him mightily in his life, but how he came to be educated. Remember, uh, um, or if you don't know, uh, George Washington Carver was born um, right during the middle of the, um, uh, of the uh, Civil War. And so uh, he was, he was 
uh, lived in that early in his life. And it's not that, and, and it's not that uh, racism or, or uh, the feeling that they had towards former slaves uh, after the Civil War went away. And also, I think we always have to be careful of the idea that, that uh, the, the South was racist and the North wasn't. That, that's, that's not true. America as a whole was racist uh, in this time and did not view uh, blacks on the, on the same equal footing. And so he was born as whites. And so he was born a very, very uh, difficult time. And so uh, he was raised, uh, his, his mother uh, was uh, stolen. Uh, so she was free, but she was stolen. And so he was raised uh, uh, by a white family uh, that loved his mother and treated her well. And he was raised by them afterwards. And uh, he showed a, uh, he, a, a, an unusual genius early on. I mean, he was just an extremely intelligent uh, man. Uh, but even a genius has to be educated. You know, you can't, you've got to learn your ABC. And, and so on. And so he used to, one time he, he went by a schoolhouse and he heard the teacher teaching the children and uh, it mesmerized him. He loved to, he loved to, to learn. And here she was, here was a place designed for learning. He literally sat on the steps and, uh, and listened that day. He went home that evening and told his parents that he wanted to go to school and they cried and they said, you can't, you're, you're black. They, they don't allow you there. And so um, he asked them, well, where can I go to school? They said, we don't know. He began to travel to the towns around him, walked eight miles to, to another town, found a school that did educate uh, young, young black students, walked back and told his parents, um, you know, I, I want to go to this school. And they said, what do you, you know, how can that be? You can't do a 16 mile round trip to go to school. It's, it's, it's just impossible. So George Washington Carver very early in his life moved from the, the, the love of, of his first home and moved to this next town over. Met the principal, uh, her name was uh, Miss Mariah Wilkins. Uh, wonderful family, her and her husband uh, had the school beside them. She took uh, George Washington Carver in. Uh, they, uh, they taught him laundry, which was basically how he was going to pay for the rest of his uh, education along, along the way. They began to educate him. Took about two years for her to pass on all of the knowledge she had. He knew he needed more. And so he went and, and he just started doing that. I mean, I'm going to tell you an abbreviated portion of this, but it was just this travel after travel after travel for, to get what he could from, from one place or one person for a few years and then move on. My favorite story uh, about that is, is uh, he moved into a new town where he wanted to attend the high school and uh, he went to knocking on doors asking uh, people if they, could, uh, if they could use any help. And, he, and he, he was really good at laundry. Most of the time he, he set up laundry businesses and did very well. No, 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 uh, down the road. Finally, one lady answers the door. She's got an apron on and, and uh, he says, can you help? And she says, can you cook? And uh, he does tell a lie and he says, oh, very well. And he evidently was not a great cook at that point. So she brings him in into the kitchen and she says, okay, here's what I need. I need bread pudding, biscuits, apple pie and coffee right now. And uh, he, uh, he's, he's, remember, he's smart. He's also really funny. Uh, he, uh, he says to her, well, I want to make it exactly the way that you want it. So will you show me how you like it made? And I'll do it that way from then on. And so she makes it for him. He's so smart. He remembers every ingredient. He remembers exactly the way he makes it the next time. And, and that's how he learns to cook. How do you want it? And she basically teaches him his job and she never picks up on it and then he adds his own and actually becomes very successful does that through the, the the next bit of school all the way through multiple multiple times along the way in fact it took George Washington Carver a uh, much longer to graduate high school than the normal student back in these days you could graduate high school uh, in your in your mid-teens he was in his 20s. The reason was is because he would go to a place, he would have to earn enough money to pay for school. When that money ran out, he would have to disenroll, he would have to earn more money, and then, and then, and if that school was not able to finish his education, uh, many of them, because he was black, they wouldn't, he would have to go to these different places. So he was behind. He finally gets accepted into college. 
spends his last bit of money, goes to college. When, when he goes to, to check in, the principal's face drops and uh, he didn't realize that George Washington Carver was black, does not allow him to attend college devastated Carver in his life. He spent two years, guys, listen to this. He spent two years there in Kansas in a sod house that he made himself and plowing and planting uh, some crops along the way. And uh, it was it was a horrible, it was a horrible time. Two winter, two Kansas winters in a mud house, two Kansas hot summers in a mud house, uh, but all along the way earning more money. Finally, uh, meet some people who were very good to him, uh, tell him of another school that, they, that he can go to. He goes, uh, is accepted. Uh, really uh, cool story about that. He, he uh, is accepted and goes to school, but none of the students have much to do with him because they don't have any commonality uh, because he's not allowed to eat in the cafeteria. He's not allowed to be in the social interactions is where you develop friends. He goes to the classes, but not the social interactions. They make him eat in a basement uh, with those other students, or he was actually the only black student, but with those other workers who, who are uh, non-white. And, and so he does that. And when the woman who sent him there and helped him along the way found out about that, she went to the school and she started eating down with them in the in the basement and the school was mortified that 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 a white woman would be uh, among these uh non-whites and uh, she said i'm going to keep doing it until you change and so they did let george washington carver eat in the cafeteria he did meet the other students great story he painted the students took up a a, a offering i guess a little bit of money from each of them so that they could send him to uh, an art fair he was an artist as well and, and uh, paid for his money, paid for his clothes, paid for his train ticket. Um, they loved him so much and he was a wonderful artist. He entered four paintings. All four of them won, won a prize against professional artists from all over the world. I think that's just a cool story of, of, of uh, you know, segregation and how horrible it was, but integration and how wonderful it was that these students saw and, and, and invested in Carver in a way, and he just cried. I mean, he was so thankful. And all of that story, all of that, I just, I want you to see, and, and so much more, it's how hard it was for him to get an education. But the world would be drastically different if he didn't. It was hard and it wasn't right, but it was hard and God used that. And later on in his life, I'm gonna tell you another story here uh, in a little bit. Later on in his life, what he did was, was change the world. It had even an impact on my personal life, uh, the way he changed the world around him. And so we've gotta be so careful that we don't always look for ease and comfort, that we don't mo make this, this idea of, of how I can um, have as easy as life, or my thinking be always the same that I don't need to change. So there are moments where God, re he renews your life. Remember, he's not moved you yet. He renews your life. Last week, Matthew 6, seek his kingdom first and his righteousness and all these things will come to you. We have to first put Jesus in that point in our life and there's gonna be moments where we fall and, and most often when we fall, it's because we are not doing the things that we need to do. We are not attending worship. We're not, att we're not being in a group. We're not giving, we're not serving. We're, we're not reading our Bible. We're not taking these things upon ourself uh, so, that, so that God can grow us and we're looking for ease and comfort. Well, I'm going to heaven, what does it matter? That's when we fall over and we're cast and we're, we're unable, but God is so gracious to get us back up. And so today, if you find yourself and you're, you believe in, in a Christianity that's just easy and convenient and doesn't require anything of you and doesn't challenge you and doesn't change you and doesn't doesn't need anything that then you've 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 looked at and you've listened to uh, some sort of modern version that's not biblical God has things for you that he wants to pour into you and are there green pastures yes but are they all the time no in fact we're going to move from them right now so let's look at the second part of this verse what does uh, God say he says <clears throat> he leads me along the right path so so he's got to renew my life because I fall down but I'm in the green pasture at this point and then he renews my life so he picks me back up but then he does something really weird he leads me along right paths. God takes me from the green pasture. He moves me. Well, that's just weird. Why would God move you from the green pasture? Here's the deal. 
Um, sheep are, uh, are so habitual by nature, if left to their own devices, they will walk the same trail be- until it becomes a deep rut that they can't get out of, literally. They will eat from the same pasture so long that they will take a lush green pasture and they will turn it into a barren desert wasteland. They will want, go to the same watering hole, hole over and over again until it is, there was once, remember, quiet waters, clear and crystal, but the sheep walking in it, urine, feces, parasites begin to develop and they will just continue out the same way. So God has to rotate us. God has to migrate. God has to move us. And just because you're in a green pasture right now uh, that, that is very fertile does not mean it will last forever, does not mean that God is now starting to move us. He's taking you on a different path. And notice today, we're not going to talk about where he's taking you. He's just saying, hey, we're moving. And you can be so confused by this as a believer. Why would you look at this green pasture? Why, why would we leave here? God knows that if we don't move, that we will overgraze it. It will go from lush to barren. And so he's got to, to move us. He sees what's ahead. And it's, it's very counterintuitive for, for us as sheep many times. You're like, maybe this is good or, or, or it was good or it seemed good or this is what I know. Why, why would you take me to this place? And God's going to move us. God's going to move us along the way. So we've got we've to be left. And he, uh, we can't be left to our own devices. We've got to go with his deliberate planned uh, movements. And so... In this, uh, the first part of that is, is an attitudinal shift that we've got to have. So let me show you what that is. We've got to move from why me to show me. If we're going to allow God to move you, you know, there, I'm going to show you how he, you know he moves you in just a second. But, but you've got to be willing to, to go from this idea of like I determine my own fate to know, God, I know what you you have something for me and I don't know what it is. Show me. Show me how to act during the season and talk during the season and think during the season. I want to trust you. And so many times, this, is, this section right here, by the way, is for those of us who say, I hate change. I don't like change. I, I, I want the same forever. And the problem, the problem is, is that you overgraze that ground and you're just, why me? Why? It was so good right here. Why do we have to move? Why do I have to leave? Why do I have to change? Why do I have to grow? As opposed to God trusting God. Hey, show me. Show me how to act during this new season. I know that you're taking me basically from one green pasture to another, but it's a trip along the way. So I want you to show me. How do I act? How do I, how do, I do those things? And so... Um, I thought a lot of, uh, uh, over the years about how to think about helping people understand, okay, how is God beginning to move you? So um, if you, you, you think about this, uh, you, you know, God, God wants to, to, to move us, to grow us. And sometimes it's a physical move. Like I didn't, I wasn't raised in, in Bastrop. Uh, we went through several strategic um, ministry moves and every step along the way God taught us something and showed us something and grew us in a way that prepared us for being here at River Valley and and, and so we didn't we didn't know River Valley we didn't know Bastrop existed um, let alone that we were gonna uh, you know be a part of this church and so but we, we see that he moved us along the way so how do you know when God's moving you. Now, again, this might be an actual physical move, but also it might be a, a change in your life, a, a, a new job, a new season, those type of things. And here's, here's the best way I can describe it. So you know when God's moving you a lot of times, because the situation moves from once delicious to less satisfying and finally to unsavory. So think about food. It moves from, I love this, this is the greatest thing, to hmm, it's not as good as it used to be to, I don't like this at all. What happened? Well, think about it. This happens, right? My chances are your favorite food at one point was chicken nuggets shaped like dinosaurs. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just, that is, man, chicken nugget day is wonderful and I love it. But you go with your buddies to a steakhouse and one of them um, orders chicken nuggets shaped like dinosaurs. Well, that's when he ceases to be your friend. <laughs> you know, you're like, dude, you're, you got to grow up, man. You, you got to order and eat something besides that macaroni, uh, right? And so it's the same way in, in life. There, there are seasons and situations that are, that are rich, 
God is blessing and God is doing and you are enjoying. And then all of a sudden, there gets this point where, where the ground is starting to get overgrazed. The ground is starting to get um, used up. Like there's, there's not that much there. He, he's moving you to a place for a reason and you're starting to see that. And then there can come to this point where it actually becomes unsavory. Like it's, it's not that good anymore. Now, I got to be careful, and I don't want you to leave, go ahead and leave this up because I, I want to be very, very careful here because I'm afraid some people will misuse what I'm saying here. So, I am not saying, in, 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 the, in this illustration, I'm not saying that, um, like, you know, like once marriage was wonderful and now it's really hard, and so you know God is moving. That's not what I'm saying at all. The Bible says He joins us together, uh, uh, one man and one woman for life. And so, so the problem, the problem there is is not the situation. The problem is you. The problem is you're not putting into the situation what needs uh, to to make it better, or both of you aren't. And but you can't control the other person. You can't control you. And so you begin to to invest. You begin to put in, and and it will become in that way, uh, delicious once again. It will become satisfying uh, once again. Also, I'm not talking about in certain situations, um, when you see this happening, you begin to blame the cook. You begin, the problem, I mean, the problem is they're just not making nuggets like they used to. I mean, it's just not the same. And, and you find out, no, it's, it's you. It's you that that's changed and that's okay they're doing nuggets the way they do nuggets and and you just don't need them anymore that's okay that's that's um that's you and not them and so if you'll leave and look for what god has for you next but but not criticize them for that that god used them for a part of your journey this happened to me in all the churches i i was at they're still all three of the churches I was really directly responsible with, uh, all doing great ministry, uh, all run by great men, but God brought me there for a season to teach me something to bring me here because this is my calling, this is my life. And so, so I didn't look at them and go, hey, what's wrong with you? You, you know, you're not giving me what I need anymore. I'm saying, no, no, no. God brought me here for a season, and now he's moving me on. And so that's, that's kind of uh, how, how you uh, know to do that. Now, again, let me go, let me go back to, to George Washington Carver and an and, uh, illustration for this. So, so George Washington Carver is most uh, known for his teaching at the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute. Um, he is, uh, Booker T. Washington is the, is the, the head of the college, and uh, that's actually why George Washington Carver, his middle name is Washington. He adopted that middle name. It was not given to him. And, and uh, so that, those two men worked together for the, the good of the people, and uh, it was a really, really... Um, uh, interesting uh, arrangement. And so uh, I, I love how Car or, uh, Carver graduated from Ames uh, College in Iowa, became on teaching there, got his master's, and was on his way to becoming fairly famous and wealthy. And, uh, and so what he did was um, uh, it, he was teaching, he was, he was learning crops, he was learning crop rotation, all of these things, becoming pretty well known. Well, uh, George uh, Booker T. Washington invites him to Tuskegee and, uh, and says, I, I have no fame to offer you. You already have that. He said, I have no money to offer you. I have only hard, hard work. And, 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 and his, his, his letter is wonderful because it's this idea of, hey, I want you to walk away from money and fame and ease at this college. And I want you to walk to this place and come here where I'm just telling you it's going to be hard. But the reason is, is if we will help our people come out of poverty. And that became the, the mantra of the rest of George Washington Carver's life. To teach his, his crop skills, to teach his agricultural uh, knowledge uh, to these, these, these poor tenant farmers that were in this endless cycle of, of uh, always having to work for someone else because they could never pay off enough money to buy basically their own freedom. It was this horrible cycle. And, and he began to see that, that I can teach them how to do better crops uh, than any other farmer around. And by doing that, they can make enough money to, to basically basically have their own farm, to basically have their own life and to support themselves and to, to rise up out of this poverty. Uh, again, a really, really inspiring uh, story for me. Um, and so, so anyway, so, so, so George Washington Carver, um, 
does this and begins all of these, these fantastic, wonderful ideas that were, that were revolutionary. It's early 1900s in his day. But he goes to Tuskegee and what they call the science department is one little shack. Uh, they have no science equipment. He went from Ames, which was very well known at this point, to, to Tuskegee, and he's got nothing. I mean, they have to, they have to search through the garbage, literally, to, to make their own supplies for chemistry. They, they, instead of having their own Bunsen burners, they have to search through the garbage and find uh, old ink wells and, and that they can make that be a Bunsen burner. They can put oil in it and light it. Uh, they, tin cans that they can uh, punch holes in the bottom so they can sift uh, dirt, that kind of thing. I mean, it was, it was a horrible, uh, uh, horribly hard existence. He's given 20 acres uh, of pretty bad land to try to, 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 try to uh, begin these crop experiments, and he becomes extremely successful. Uh, and he begins to become extremely well-known. By the end of his life, George Washington Carver is literally one of the most famous men uh, in all the world. And that's back when fame meant something because he did something for his fame. Uh, these days, you just you can be famous for nothing, uh, it seems like. And so, uh, but he, he, was, he was changing the world, but, but he realized that, that the people, that the, 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 black, um, the black sharecroppers, the black uh, uh, farmers uh, couldn't afford and, and, uh, to, to come see him, to learn from him. So he began what he called his mobile farm. And he hitched up horses and a wagon and he began to travel around to these different farmers and he began to show them how to do crops. Now here's, here's, here's the point of, of all of this illustration. It really is powerful if you'll listen. Carver first talked to the farmers. Now these guys, these, these are doing the same thing that everyone else around them do, is doing, especially in the South and that's cotton. Cotton is a great cash crop, plays a, pays a lot of money. The problem is cotton depletes the soil. This was brand new, we know this today, but they did not know this. Uh, no one knew this, uh, basically, in the early 1900s. And he began to show them, how many, how many uh, pounds per acre of cotton did you get last year? They could tell them immediately. Farmers can all, always tell you what their, what their yield is, how many pounds per acre, and also what the price was. You can't do anything about the price, it's a commodity. You can do something about your yield by, by uh, farming wisely. And so they began to tell them, and year after year, their yields were going down. The reason was, is they were uh, depleting the, the necessary nutrients to grow good cotton. And Carver then would go them in, into his mobile farm and he would pull out and he would show them the kind of cotton that they could grow. The average farmer at this time, um, a bumper crop was 100 pounds per acre, a bumper crop. Most of them were about 75 pounds per acre. Carver could grow year after year 500 pounds per acre. And the reason was he showed, he did crop rotation. He planted black-eyed peas. Most, like cotton, takes out nitrogen from the soil into the plant. Black-eyed peas are very interesting because they take nitrogen out of the air into the plant and put it into the soil. And so he began to show them and then began to pull out other uh, vegetables and fruit that were so much bigger than they could imagine. Uh, it looked like those, those uh, county, uh, county fair prizes, you know, these giant uh, uh, things. And, and one of the funny ones that he did was he would bring out tomatoes. In this day, tomatoes were thought of as poisonous. And uh, people would not eat tomatoes. They would grow wild, but people wouldn't eat them. They would say, don't eat those, they're poisonous. And Carter was famous of, of, uh, in speeches as well, taking a tomato on the stage and he would go like that, about to bite it. And people, oh, I mean, he's about to bite something poisonous. He would bite it and eat it. And he would show, and then he would say, as you can see, I'm not dead. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and just show them how they could, could change the way they were doing and show them the fruit of what they could produce. What was interesting about all of this is that some of the farmers said, I can't change the way I'm doing it. I'm too scared to change. And so what happened with their life? Less and less and less yields on crops further and further and further behind in their debts, more and more and more enslaved to the people that they rented the farms with. Why? Because they wouldn't change. What happened to the people who listened to Carver? Greater and greater and greater yields, eventual freedom. He also, he was 
he was actually a really interesting Renaissance man. I just, I love this chapter. I mean, you can just tell. Um, because uh, he was a genius, but he was also in what he did with crops. But he was also one of the best teachers that most people had ever had. And, and he was teaching. The, it wasn't just so smart that no one could understand him. He was teaching these. And there are whole groups of people. There are whole families who, who uh, thrived and began to do so much better because of what God did in his life. <clears throat> and I told you, that's, that's where I come into the story. See, my, my granddad, he's a cotton farmer. He was a cotton farmer in West Texas. And I can remember, my granddad was a very successful cotton farmer, did very well, provided for his family well, uh, uh, and, and, you know, just, just a really great man. Um, and my, my granddad, I can remember going to his farm when I was little and uh, seeing, he had about a section of land, it's about a, qu- a square mile, and uh, I can remember seeing cotton, 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 but, but every year there would be a new field and it wouldn't be cotton. And it would be some other plant. And my granddad, I'll never forget, my granddad would, would raise these plants. And I can remember uh, this, these plants being really high. And my granddad just coming through and shredding them and mowing them down. And it just falling in and eventually just plowing these plants back into the soil. And what was he doing? He was, he was replenishing what the cotton had taken out. And he was rotating where he did that every year. And, and where did he learn that? And the answer is George Washington Carver. The answer is when, my, when I was a senior in high school, my granddad bought me a car to go to college and guess where he got the money? From farming. Guess why he was able to, to pay for that money? George Washington Carver. I mean, that, it, it's, it's such a wonderful idea. This idea of if you will listen to people who are doing it better, if you will be willing to say, you know what, this, this field... It's getting a little dry. It's getting a little barren. I need to change before God forces me to. Or, or maybe he's using the sermon today to, to show you to change, to do something new and different. Maybe you're parenting exactly the way your parents parented. Maybe you're doing marriage exactly the way that you've always seen marriage done versus on how the Bible teaches you to do those things or money or life or philosophy or anything else versus the way the Bible teaches you. Today, get on the right path. Go the right direction and watch God change your life. Change your life. He's going to show you change and it's wonderful. It's better it's more invigorating. He doesn't expect us to say the same way for the same uh, forever. And especially those of you who are maybe like me, kind of midlife. Listen, if you're not seeing change in your life, not change that's forced on you because of just eventual life, but I'm saying you're not seeing yourself better, more equipped, you're better at praying, you know Jesus more, you love people more, you, you're more generous, then let Jesus change you today. Ask him take me on the right path. So the reason is for his name's sake. God wants to show these sheep off, you and I, and say, this one brings me pride. This is my show sheep. This is the best of the flock. This is the one who listens to me the most and follows me the closest. And this is the one that really is uh, exemplary of the type of sheep I'm trying to bring to my flock. So let's pray for that right now. I want to invite you right where you are uh, in your homes. Uh, just let's pray for a moment. And let's, let's look at where we're at. And let's look at where God is taking us. And look at, let's look at what is happening around us. And let's say, you know what? Sometimes I'm just cast. I'm lying on the side because I've, I've chosen ease and comfort and convenience and just thinking that, you know, well, if God really loved me, he'd just make my life nice all the time. That's not Christianity. Maybe today you need to call out to Jesus and change, change me, change my circumstances, change my location, take me on your right path. I don't want to live with this ever, no, 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 uh, dice, uh, just no change from where I am. Instead, I want to follow you. I want to be more in love with you today than ever before. And that's scary because, again, we don't know where we're going. We're going to talk about in the days to come, in the sermons to come. 
But right now, the sheep, all he knows is they're on a path. That green pasture is getting further and further and further. The quiet water is behind them. And they're going in a direction they've never been before. That's scary. That's unusual. But he is the good shepherd. He will lead you correctly. Lord Jesus, I thank you for leading us. I thank you for guiding who we are and what we need from you. And I ask you today to take us on the right path. I ask you today to make us the type of sheep who are worthy of the name of Jesus Christ. For your glory and honor, amen. Thank you guys for coming today. Thank you guys for being online with us today. I love you, River Valley, and I'll see you next week. Thanks.